I see reality for what it truly is in a way only someone who binged the Higley Town heroes can understand. And I'm here to impart that wisdom. I killed the video the show. I do. I do. Butt lovers. Here we are again, from Word Girl to the Goldfish Crackers commercials to Special Agent Oso to Martha Speaks, we explore the media that no one else is brave enough to. Today we are entering the world of Higley Town Heroes and what a world it is. Let's start surface level and make our way deeper. Higley Town Heroes is a Playhouse Disney show that aired from 2004 to 2008 and totaled 65 episodes, all of which are on Disney Plus, but they combined season two and season three and all of the episodes are out of order. I have a real bone to pick with the way they put up children's TV shows on streaming platforms. The order matters. Even though they're self-contained stories, think of the weirdos like me out there, okay? There's one episode where Kip meets his dog Shadow and then Shadow is seen from that point on throughout the series. But you decide to show me Shadow before they even met? I need a timeline of events here, people. Speaking of time, let's look at a time prior to the main series. Back in 2003, Higley Town Heroes was actually only a mini show on Disney. As you can see, all the character designs are a bit different. The children Newbie, Wayne, Twinkle, and Kip are all wearing different clothing, and the animal sidekick Fran is a flying squirrel, as opposed to the less impressive non-flying squirrel we're used to seeing her as. I'm gonna roast her a lot more later, just you wait. This mini show is actually partially lost media. We have these stills, some animation from the promo commercials, and we also have the original theme song, which is so different than the one for the main series. It goes a little something like this. Look around, what do you see? Heroes helping you and me. Come on, let's all be Higley Town heroes. I mean, it's not bad, but now let's analyze the theme song from the main show, actually performed by They Might Be Giants, which you know what? power move. Now I have to address this so you can't say I didn't warn you, but the theme song is by far the best song in the entire series. None of the other ones even come close. They'll learn about real heroes, who and what and how. Nah. The visuals during the theme song sequence gives you some insight on the fever dream we're all about to collectively have. Let me read you my bullet points from the first time I watched it, but first, as always, let me show you my research. Don't ask me if I'm okay. Don't ask me if I'm okay. Look at the planet opening up. When I was younger, I thought we lived inside the Earth, which is just the reality of these guys, I guess. Big Bang was more like the big and the earth just shit everything out. There is no God in Higley Town Heroes. Where's a sermon about that? Let's address the elephant in the room. They are nesting dolls. They can pop in and out of each other. Now this is not a fact of the show that can go ignored, and it's actually something that influences almost everything I talk about. There are layers to this. Their traditions, their geography, their economy, their technology, their anatomy. Everything is influenced by the fact that they're nesting dolls. Now we'll dissect this elephant in the room that I've been hyping up, but first let's talk about the squirrel in the room. Franny, Franny, Fran, you thought you can get away from me. Nope, you already know I have to roast the animal sidekick. This is a tradition that started with Captain Huggy Face and made its way to Oso. How old is this man? How old is this man? How old is Fran? Short answer, she's a fully grown adult hanging out with kindergartners. Receipts in the episode Fran takes a hike. She talks about when she was younger and the kids gasp and she exclaims, You kids didn't always think I was a grown up, did you? Now why is she always around these kids? You know, I actually see Fran as a nanny, but the nanny named Fran. But in the episode Smooth Operator, she was with the kids and Kip's parents still wanted a babysitter. Very strange, considering in Soup for the Stars, Fran actually took the children to a grocery store alone with the mother even pointing out, stay close to Fran, kids. Now I was about to chalk this up as inconsistency until I got to season one, episode 25, B, a really hot day. They're visiting a local swimming pool and Fran says they need a grown up to watch them, which makes total sense because if they drown, what the fuck is Fran gonna do? Same applies if they're alone in a house and they get crushed by something, what is Fran gonna do? So this is why they're actually more safe in public alone with Fran because A, stranger danger does not exist in this world. Everyone is morally good and wants to help them. Them. To the point that B, there will always be somebody there to protect them outside of the talking squirrel when they're out in public. I still don't know why she was watching them through their school window and broke in during nap time in the episode Say What? And Say What is right! What was she thinking, clingy bitch? Side note, she's also the only animal to talk in this series. I mean, besides Yubi's parrot that just repeats phrases, but like, so do real parrots. You're not special. Anyway, at first we actually don't see any other squirrels except in her imagination when she's explaining the 
squirrel holiday, Acorn Day, which she decides to celebrate with these human kids instead of other squirrels. Hmm, so I was starting to think she was the only squirrel? That is until the two-part holiday special Twinkle's Wish where we see her parents. And later on we discover she has seven siblings. And they only speak the language squirrelish, which just sounds like squeaking and like squirrel noises. They never get into why she learned English. I think it's just that classic Meowth treatment of like, oh, she just felt like it. Every episode follows a similar formula. The kids are faced with a problem. At some point, my favorite stoner pizza guy comes in and greets them with something like, <laughs> What's up, my little higgly wigglies? And then when he leaves, he goes, Cheese you later. And he's also hot for some reason. And also, apparently, I've never had an original thought in my life because somebody on Twitter thought the exact same thing. <laughs> Anyway, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so the kids have a problem and Twinkle always thinks she has a solution. Pulling down a giant sheet of paper no matter where they are to draw it out and talk about her elaborate plan. Fran always says something along the lines of That's stupid as shit and would never work. To which Twinkle responds with Aw, pickles. Every time. Then Yubi's like, maybe we need the help of someone special. Immediate song. Someone special, who could it be? This job's too big for you and me. We need some help, but never fear oh. It looks like a job for a Higley Town hero. The hero is summoned with the power of song. Then the hero helps them. The kids decide they want to be a hero just like you. Then the hero gives them some basic ass advice on how they can also be a hero. And it's always something so simple, like, Remember kids, and if you wipe your ass every day, you too can be Italy Town Heroes! I've also taken the liberty of writing down every single Higley Town hero, so if you don't mind, I'm just gonna list them off with little comments along the way. Firefighter, plumber, gardener, veterinarian, electrician, phone operator, does that even exist anymore? Garbage man with excessive chest hair, weather person, painter, farmer, police dog, tugboat captain, tow truck driver, librarian who did not whisper sing, which annoyed me, grocery store worker, carpenter, who built them an entire clubhouse for free, more on that later. Bus driver, optometrist, grandma who knows how to knit, voiced by Betty freaking White. Cop, a Christmas elf, seeing eye dog, chicken farmer, which is weird because they already did farmer. Taylor, playground monitor, translator, conductor, baker, coach, teacher. Great Aunt Shirley, just because she's a hundred years old, taking respect your elders to a whole new level. Or a stranger, detective. So this detective was actually investigating a mysterious noise in Kip's house that like startled the children. So I guess there's not many mysteries in Higleytown. Taxi driver, shelter worker, firefighter, ambulance driver, Operator, judge, cowboy, snowplow driver, truck driver who restocks stores, lifeguard, street sweeper, zookeeper, beekeeper, bars, school nurse, dentist, barber, submarine captain, dance instructor, tree trimmer, banker, furnace repairman, environmentalist, pizza guy, my beloved. He was actually featured as a hero because he made personalized valentines for everyone in town. What a sweetie. Uh, an absolute fucking heartthrob. Fran's a hero apparently just because she can climb a tree. Pediatrician, waiter, mountain rescue squad, police for the third time. Astronaut, dog trainer, lighthouse keeper, window cleaner, ice resurfacer, paleontologist, more on that later. Air traffic control photographer. They call the photographer to help them document the Higley Squatch, which I guess urban legends are just casually real in this world, just like in Martha Speaks, honestly. <laughs> Well, she's very nice. The idea of a giant opossum just scares the shit out of me. Instilling the questioning of our reality in us very young. I think it would have been funnier if they called like a conspiracy theorist to help them out with this one. I'm a conspiracy theorist. Yes, sir. None of us are real. Not you or me. Back to the list. Drawbridge operator, x-ray technician. More on that later. Printer, movers, helicopter pilot, bulldozer driver, motel manager, sheep shearer, babysitter, road workers. Yeah, I sure hope they do. <laughs> Worker. I hardly know her. <laughs> Nice. Almost there. Art museum curator, musher, animal control, laundry worker, doctor, auto mechanic, a cow. Ooh. Camp counselor, janitor, fairy captain, receptionist, physical therapist, map maker, a camel. Reporter, musician, tour guide, auctioneer, vet, again. Allergist, locksmith, roofer, sign language interpreter, famous Twitch streamer, ninja, is who this guy looks like. He's actually just a bike repairman. Plumber, again. Engineer, dump truck driver, customer service clerk, coast guard, freight train engineer, house painter, Uncle Lemo, the cook. Photographer, again. Trail donkey, ski patroller, rescue workers, collectively. Phone repairman, airplane pilot, marine biologist, just referee, bricklayer man, usher, lunch lady, and finally, hall monitor. Kinda weird that YouTuber wasn't mentioned. I'm a YouTuber, I sell merch to kids, pretend I'm likable, then fuck a coworker, bitch. I'm still not over it. So I'm sure you noticed that throughout this list, some of these heroes weren't even professions. Like some were just family members, friends, or animals that could help out with a certain task. The message of the show is way less about, and one day you can get a job too, you little freeloader. And more like, hey, doesn't it feel good to help others? So up until this point, we've had a very tip of the iceberg discussion. Had a few goofs, had a few laughs, sure. It's time to talk about anatomy. 
Your snowballs! Not sure if I've mentioned this, but the humans and animals are nesting dolls. They don't have legs or feet, which changes a lot of the terminology of this world. For example, the impressions they leave on the ground aren't footprints, they're bounce prints, which I actually think is a huge freaking cop-out. Just call them butt prints. That's what creates the impression. It's not about the way they move around. We don't call footprints walk prints. <sighs> Anyway, yes, they move around by bouncing or gliding. There is no way for them to sit because there is no hinge, there's no joint. They're always either standing up or lying down. We've seen this ever so slightly tilted form of them when they had to go on one knee to propose, even though they don't have knees. What are you talking about? And also in the episode Green and the Gills, we found out what sitting in someone's lap means to them. They have to separate themselves so somebody could sit inside the bottom half. I'll let you take as much time to process this as you need. It's all downhill from here. For example, when a mother checks to see if her child defecated, she opens her up and sniffs inside. This means the shit is just sitting inside of them, waiting to be emptied. Well, I mean, that's kind of like how it works for us too, but there are no holes. This leads me to a question we were all avoiding. How are babies made? My first thought, since there are clearly no genitals, was, okay, maybe it's asexual reproduction, but turns out, no. In the episode Baby Boom, there's a couple, and the husband of the woman keeps saying, we're having a baby, which means there's some sort of mixing of genetics. I have two theories for this, and neither of them are pretty. So my first theory is that they kind of just swapped bottom halves, but as I pitched this to a friend, they said, what if it was just two bottom halves together? Taking bottom to a whole new level. So they're just like decapitated watching this? <laughs> Good job with that. <laughs> also, how does giving birth work? When the woman was pregnant, we never saw her split in half. So I'm hoping that when people and animals are pregnant in this world, they can't just like they usually do. I'm hoping they're just sealed shut. Anyway, the way the woman realizes the baby is coming is we hear a loud knock. So what this tells us is their skin is wood-like as expected. And like I said before, there is no hole other than when they so to give birth, I think they're just going into the hospital to break the pregnancy seal. You know, like, congratulations, it's a nesting doll. Aww. There is one episode, however, where a vet is helping a horse give birth, and they cover up the bottom half while the vet says, push, push what? From where? Now let's talk about their bones. I bet you guys are like, are you shitting me? No, they're just made out of wood. You would think. You would think. In the episode Wayne's Big Discovery, we see a skeleton of a dinosaur. I forgot to mention, dinosaurs are also nesting dolls. Based on the bones, we see that the skull is intact, as well as the appendages like the arm and the tail. The ribcage, spine, and hip bones, however, leave this hollowness for that classic nesting doll belly. Since we see the skull, one question I have is, when they're popping in and out of each other, is there like a layer that blocks off the skull from like the empty section? Or when they pop in and out of each other, is the skull just chilling there and, and they just have to be cool about it? God damn, I hate that. I'll leave you with one last thing about their goofy bodies before we move on to technology. In the episode Kip's Shadow, when Kip spontaneously meets this dog that he wasn't anticipating to meet, he pulls out a dog food bowl and a water bowl from his little belly. Now we've seen this belly storage used like this before, but why would Kip put those things inside him when he had no idea he was gonna meet this dog. Wayne is the one that's always prepared. Kip is the spontaneous one. So if he didn't put the bulls in there, how did he pull them out? Well, I believe their stomachs are more than just storage. I believe their tummies can also act as black holes that can manifest whatever they need in an emergency situation. No further comment. What 24 hours of Higglytown Heroes does to a motherfucker. Every vehicle in Higglytown accounts for the fact that they can't sit down and they don't have feet, which, you know, no shit. But you really wouldn't think about it unless you were watching as intensely as me, and I don't know why you'd be doing that. So when people are driving, they stand, and there's no pedals, they just press buttons to start and stop. These modifications surprisingly give their vehicles a very futuristic look. And I can't mention transportation without talking about how all over the place Pizza Guy is. The pizza delivery budget is insane. He has multiple flying machines, a tram, a motorcycle, a car, a unicycle looking thing, a go-go spring, which is this world's version of a pogo stick, and much, much more. Another example of their imaginative tech is with their instruments. With all these fun shapes and colors, it really gives me Dr. Seuss vibes. Speaking of which, let me introduce you to this very unique sport they play called Higgly Ball. And the game is played kind of 
like soccer, but I want to speak less about the game and more about the ball itself. It celebrates when you score a goal. Look at this! Now don't get me wrong, there are still some things about their tech that are impractical. For example, this man has to lift his pregnant wife over his head to get her in the car. Very inconvenient, though hot and sexy of him, I must say. But I think how advanced their tech is can best be emphasized when talking about their space technology. This whole entire section talks about the episode The Fran and the Moon. Now, first of all, they mention Earth, the Milky Way galaxy, and all the planets in our solar system by name. This is further confirmation that this is our Earth, not a separate planet or anything like that. Also, the theme song totally lied to us about Earth being a nesting doll. Their Earth just looks like regular Earth because it is regular Earth. Betrayal aside, this episode starts with scientists telling the kids that they're making an Earth capsule to leave on the moon. And here's where I actually learned something from Higley Town Heroes, because I thought, have we done this before? Have we left things on the moon and in space? And turns out, yes! According to this Washington Post article, the Apollo 11 crew brought a silicone disc to leave on the moon. It contained goodwill messages from the leaders of 73 countries. Each message promoted friendship. An astronaut also left this picture of his family on the moon, which I think is very cute. And in the 70s, we actually left a message for aliens and or future astroarchaeologists to find. I just thought this was super cool, and I can't believe I learned about it through Higley Town Heroes of all things. Ew, real life, yucky. No more of that, please. Back to Higley Town Heroes. I actually think their space technology is way more advanced than ours, because when Fran accidentally fell asleep in the Earth capsule and was sent to the freaking moon, dumbass alert, an astronaut immediately took a rocket with all of the kids in the kids' family to go to the moon. Like, that's how easy a trip to the moon was. She didn't need to contact anybody, and she just brought random kids. All in, like, 15 minutes? In 2022, in our non-nesting doll world, this is not a reality for us. This just goes to show how well-funded every profession is. Well, except cowboys. I work real hard for not much pay. Thank you, Disney's Higley Town Heroes. Very cool. For the longest time watching this, I wasn't even convinced money existed in this world. Like, they would go to the supermarket and we never saw them pay for anything. They'd summon heroes that would do a job for free. And this wasn't even pointed out until the episode Catch Up With Catch Up when a bus driver says, it's ride for free day. Interesting. In the season two episode, Wayne's Pieces of Gold, we finally see their currency for the first time. Their currency is coins, and Wayne actually won 10 in the school science fair. Now he wanted to buy a super deluxe toaster that was worth 15 coins. According to my research, a smart toaster is about 160 USD, these nuts. <laughs> so each of these Higley coins is worth about 11 USD. They can get so much for their dollar and still things are pretty reasonably priced. With all of this in mind, as well as their advanced tech and moral superiority, I think it's safe to say they're superior to us in every way. Now I'd also love to know how much workers get paid, but they never got into specifics. All we know is cowboys work for minimum wage. So we know this is set in Earth and that our main setting is Higley Town, but there are a few episodes where we venture beyond that and check out a few new places, which gives us a lot of insight on the rest of the world. For example, Yubi's cousin is from Higley Bigley City. At first, First, I thought this was their version of New York because their train stopped at Grand Higley Station and they were seeing a show on Higley Way. But I soon realized that this was actually a combination of every major city. They have landmarks of the Eiffel Tower, a Coliseum, Leaning Tower of Pisa, Taj Mahal, and more. This intrigues me because we've heard them say the names of countries without throwing like random Higleys in there. So I'm wondering if this world has a France with an Eiffel Tower and this Higley Bigley city is just stealing everyone's swag. Very unclear. Also, most importantly, they have of a universal written language. Here's some examples of that. This is probably just so they didn't have to add in different text in the animation, but it adds to the advanced species theory, so I'm using it. Advanced species theory, did you say? So at this point, you should know they're already more advanced than us. This is the ideal human form. But let me pose this question to you. How and why are they aware of our existence? The skeletons they show in the Halloween special have legs. Originally, I thought, okay, maybe we exist to them as like some sort of mythical creature or perhaps like an alternate universe to their Earth. Like in Everything Everywhere All at Once, there were these humans that just had hot dogs for fingers. In the episode, A Slippery Situation, an x-ray technician has our skeleton on his uniform. That is a medical professional. We are real to them. So do we coexist? Highly unlikely likely because we've never seen people that look like us in the Higley world. The only human we saw that looks like us in Higley Town was Jojo from Jojo's Circus and that was just a picture of her. Weird Easter egg, by the way. Evolution also seems unlikely because their dinosaurs are different from ours. New theory. This is actually our Earth after we were wiped 
out. And since almost everything is cyclical, they would have new dinosaurs. The only thing that changed is this nesting doll form. But what's the evolutional advantage? Protection. Their bodies are way more resistant than ours. And not only that, if there was like a nuclear war, they could just pop in each other, pop in each other, pop, saving thousands, if not millions of people. Plus, if everyone's shaped the same, there's no body shaming. Think about it. It truly is the least problematic Earth. Well, except for that one lesson. More pink, more pink, more pink for the twink. What? First, we'll get into the best lesson before we talk about the one I absolutely despise. The episode Calling All Heroes takes on a way more serious tone. It involved a big natural disaster that caused a lot of havoc. No death, of course, from what I've seen. And it was still more cartoony with pizza dough being involved. But they ended up looking for a lost cat and the confusion and fear with the kids was very realistic. They were asking questions like, why did this happen? We didn't do anything wrong, right? Which I think is a good way to approach this topic because kids watching with similar things having happened to them might ask similar questions to their parents. Now the worst lesson, in my opinion, happens in Don't Fence Me In. Uncle Lemo and his co-worker slash neighbor are beefing because she started painting his fence a color he didn't want. And then she was like, well, this is my fence. She was on his side of the property, by the way. No question in my mind, Lemo is completely right. But they go to a judge and the judge says, sometimes even the best of friends fight. So we just have to compromise and they're forced to paint their fence one plank the color she wants, one plank the color he wants, one plank the This is bullshit. It doesn't matter how close friends you are with someone, sometimes people are just wrong. This is one of those instances, this is why I grew up to be such a pushover, I swear. <sighs> to cool myself down, I will be trying the super colossal sandwich, which is a recipe they just randomly dropped, and it sounds delicious. The ingredients are as follows. On toasted bread, put on peanut butter, cream cheese, banana, strawberries, and honey. She's here. While my family watched me make this, they kept saying, and I quote, that looks disgusting, that sounds disgusting. But I have to disagree. I'd be more surprised if this didn't taste good. First bite. <laughs> Exquisite. The Higley Town hero of my life is this damn sandwich. A hero just like you. What a fun existential time we had together. Please leave in the comments what future lore video you want me to make. I'll probably ask you guys in a community tab poll which one I should do next. But I really hope you enjoyed this one, butt lovers. Have a great day out there. Stay safe. Bye.